Hello and welcome to this edition of A Conversation With. I'm Jim Marshall of the New Bedford Cable Network and joining us today via Zoom is Professor Brian Williams from UMass Dartmouth, who is the uh, expert go-to guy for a lot of different media outlets when it comes to things happening halfway across the world. And I wanted to touch base with him today to sort of talk about the situation going on in Ukraine and to sort of uh, give us sort of a, a 101, you, you know, Ukraine 101 college class as to what people are seeing on a daily basis out there right now. First of all, thanks for coming in. I know that obviously you, your schedule is tight and I appreciate it very much. Oh, my pleasure. Always a chance to talk about Ukraine and, and the war is, is a real pleasure. So thank you. You obviously, your expertise, this is, you know, you've done stuff on Russia and Afghanistan and Ukraine. This is sort of your I don't want to say specialty, but it, it is your specialty, your, your, what you have done your whole career. Um, the first thing I wanted to touch base upon is sort of describing what is Ukraine? What is it like pre-Russian uh, invasion? Yeah, so I first fell in love with Ukraine uh, as an undergraduate student uh, back at, at the age of like 18 and 19 when I was living in the Soviet Union, uh, in Soviet Ukraine, in Kiev. Uh, I found it to be a, a country that was rich in culture, rich in history, uh, and it, it was enthralling for someone from Florida uh, to be living in the Soviet communist states uh, back then and see these, these magnificent gold-covered churches built a thousand years ago, uh, walls of castles that were built to hold off the Mongol invaders, uh, a very vibrant, rich culture and a rich people, and the history is very important. Uh, because right now, there's an effort being launched uh, by Vladimir Putin to rewrite the history of Ukraine, uh, to sort of uh, define them not as an ethnic group or a, a race or a nation or a people, but as somehow part of Russia. Uh, and therefore, they belong back under his rule, uh, back in, in a, under his autocratic dictatorial rule. And the truth is that the Ukrainians are different from the Russians. You know, you may have heard about the, the terrible Russian ruler, Ivan the Terrible, mm -hmm. uh, who, who killed thousands of his own people, and the Russian state had, had harsh serfdom. You know, the, the people were almost like slaves. Uh, and many of these Russians escaped from this cruel, dark Russian empire and fled south to the open plains south of the forest of Russia to a place they called Ukraine. Uh, that means the frontier. And there they established a free democracy. Uh, you may have heard about them, the famous Cossacks. Uh, so the Cossacks lived down there for hundreds of years, from about the 1500s up until the 1900s, free until they were conquered by Russia. And uh, that's sort of the story of how they were, were brought into the Russian Empire. And of course, they broke away uh, in 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. Ukraine itself, uh, and you hear it in the newscast all the time, is the size of Texas land wise. It does seem to have a diverse uh land uh in that you, they've got a coast uh the black sea they've got mountains regions they they, they do have uh my understanding grain wheat i guess is a, is a big export there so it's very diverse the land itself that's true you know i spent uh time down in, in the crimean peninsula uh which was part of ukraine until 2014 uh when vladimir putin invaded it and conquered it and the Crimean Peninsula in the south was almost like the, the Florida uh, for the Soviet Union. Uh, they had beaches, uh, warm weather, palm trees. Uh, so that's one sort of uh, terrain down there in the south, uh, much warmer. Uh, as you move north into Ukraine, you encounter a vast open plain uh, called the steppes, uh, the steppes of Eurasia, a plain that extends from Ukraine all the way across southern Russia and across Kazakhstan. Uh, into Mongolia. Uh, it's almost like, say, Nebraska mm -hmm. uh, or, or, or Colorado, you know, the plains and states. A vast open plain uh, that when the Russians conquered it, you know, they, they, they crushed the indigenous people living there, uh, these sort of nomadic uh, Muslim Mongol Tatars, uh, kind of like how we conquered the Indians of, of the West, you know, the Sioux, for example. And then they transformed the Ukraine into uh, Russia, the Soviet Union's grain belt. Uh, it's prime dark soil, and it's great for growing uh, wheat and crops, like, uh, like grains. Uh, so then in the West, you know, towards Poland and Romania, 
you have these, these forested mountains. Uh, it's much hillier and much more European and much more linked culturally uh, to say Poland or Western Europe uh, than the open plains uh, to the east. One of the things that, that I find interesting, obviously, is that Ukraine obviously was under the Soviet uh, influence. I don't want to say exactly control because it, it was always, it was a country in and of itself. It was never, Ukraine was there, as you mentioned. Um, but it, it did seem to really have its own personality, if you will, um, that was separate from the Soviet Union at the time. Yeah, and you're right. You know, uh, it was a free country. It was brought into uh, the Russian Empire uh, and then the Soviet Union, but it was always much more Western focused than the Russians. You know, especially in the West, towards the mountains around a town called Lviv or Lvov. Uh, you know, they're very Western European. Uh, and of course, they have their own alphabet, and Ukrainian is different, so it's a Russian. Uh, they're close, you know, they're, they're brother and sister languages, uh, but they have their own distinct personality. Uh, they're much more drawn to democracy, uh, to Western concepts of freedom and, and liberty uh, than the Russians, who for hundreds of years lived under these autocratic dictators uh, called czars. One, um, so, you know, we look, as you mentioned, 1991 was the year when, when the Soviet Union fell and Ukraine, Ukraine became, you know, its own country without the Russian, quote, influence, although the first president leader certainly did have sort of a Russian leaning uh, aspect to him as well. Um, but obviously, in, in the people, uh, the, the Ukrainian people wanted him out and they got him out of office. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Vladimir Putin uh, did a great job of sort of keeping fellow dictators, uh, almost Soviet-style rulers, uh, in control uh, in the two neighboring countries. Uh, one to the north was called Belarus or Belarusia. It means White Russia, and there he has a very strict, almost Putin-esque ruler named Alexander Lukashenko, a very close friend um, uh, to Putin. And just like Putin, when people in his country voted. Uh, and he stole the election and they came out and protested. Uh, he had them arrested in the thousands. Uh, he had them killed, uh, exiled. Uh, so Lukashenko, like Putin, crushed democracy to the north of Ukraine in the country of Belarusia. But down in Ukraine, they finally stood up uh, to Putin's puppet, uh, a guy named Viktor Yanukovych, uh, who was autocratic and he wanted to keep Ukraine linked to Russia, linked to this country that was autocratic and anti-democratic. But the Ukrainians voted overwhelmingly uh, in 2014, uh, and they voted against Viktor Yanukovych, and they overthrew his rule, and uh, it's called the Orange Revolution. And they broke away from Russian dominance, and for the first time in hundreds of years, they had the chance to reunite with Europe, to reunite with the democracies. Uh, and so that's what the, the problems began with. And this is why uh, Vladimir Putin chose to punish them uh, by invading this province I lived in and actually wrote two books about uh, called the Crimean Peninsula uh, and invading it and conquering it uh, back in April and March of um, 2014. The one thing that has struck me, and I mean, ob you know, obviously I've heard Ukraine and, and what have you, but the cities, when you looked at Kiev and you looked at some of the other cities there, uh, well-populated, places. I mean, millions of people living in the cities, very modern too, very, um, like you could see the art districts and it just was a very uh, live, it seems a very lively place, those, those cities. Yeah, you know, Kiev, the capital, uh, is being surrounded for a potential siege uh, in the largest military operation in Europe since World War II. Uh, you know, this is a city of, of three million people. As a metropolis, uh, it's a vibrant Western capital. You have McDonald's there and Starbucks and shopping malls and skyscrapers built around the sort of ancient older capital. And of course, you have the sort of um, 1950s and 60s grim Soviet you know, concrete architecture, and this brutalist uh, Soviet style architecture. Uh, but it, it's a city that's modernizing. It's a city that's Westernizing. Uh, a city that has a lot of young people who are on the internet and, and speaking English, you know, they're, they're all learning English now. Uh, so it's a westernizing city of 3 million people. And God forbid uh, the Russians do succeed in surrounding it 
uh, and penetrating it and, and launching a massive bombardment, aerial and artillery, and crushing the people there because it'll be a, a bloodbath. You know, the Russians under Putin have a, a history of annihilating cities. You, know, you should call Putin the city destroyer. Uh, for example, back in 1994, 96, the Russians attacked Grozny and firebombed it. But then under Putin in 2000, they wiped Grozny, the capital of, of a breakaway republic uh, called Chechnya. They wiped the capital off the map. Uh, almost like they call, they call it the, the Caucasian Hiroshima. It's in the Caucasian mountains. So they, they wiped off the city in, in the Caucasus, a uh, city of half a million people with um, weapons banned by Geneva Convention against civilian cities. They, they wiped out the city with uh, uh, ballistic missiles called SCUDs. They dropped firebombs on it, napalm, uh, vacuum bombs, fuel air explosives. And certainly Putin did the same thing to Syria's largest city, a town called Aleppo. Uh, to help out a fellow dictator, Assad. He, he wiped it off the planet with barrel bombs and, and napalm and, and strategic bombers. So you, you mentioned, yeah, you, Kiev is, is, is a very modernizing, Western, thriving city. I fear for this city as Putin, the city destroyer, sends in his, his artillery and tanks and air force uh, to smash this democracy and bring it back into his dark iron curtain. I was going to say is, is, you know, the arts and the culture in, in, in Kiev is, it seems unbelievable when you, when you looked at it beforehand. Uh, in the weeks leading up to the attack, when you see people downtown, it seemed a very vibrant arts and culture place. Um, oh, yeah. As, like as, a place as, you'd want to visit, really. Oh, yeah. You know, as, as a young person, once again, coming from, from Florida uh, and seeing this city uh, that's a thousand years old, or, you know, over a thousand years old, and seeing these magnificent uh, cathedrals and churches, uh, museums, uh, it, it is a city of arts, uh, a thriving city of culture. And, and you, you know, whenever you have a war and you hit a city like that, whether it be the, the, the Allied bombing of Dresden, the German city during World War II, which was a, a very artistic city, and the British and Americans firebombed it and wiped out so much history and culture and art. And, and you, you hope that these, these Russians under Putin, who've been so indiscriminate in their firebombing of Grozny and the firebombing of Aleppo in Syria, you hope that they don't destroy this, this, this magnificent city uh, just to crush uh, Vladimir Zelensky, uh, this very heroic uh, president who stand, stood up to him in the name of democracy and, and trying to overthrow his pro-European, pro-American and pro-democratic uh, regime in Ukraine. When you talk, and obviously your perspective is unique because you, you know, you you visited these places, but you also you teach local kids here in, in New Bedford and Dartmouth and what have you. And as you try to talk to them, um, what would you say? Why is why is this situation? Why is Ukraine important to us? And, and that, that's a vital question, uh, and I think it's important uh, for me to tell my students, my students, and and uh, uh, those listening. Ukraine is important. You know, I've been watching the news coverage, uh, both you know, in Russia and Ukraine and in America as well. And there seems to be almost this, this, this messaging coming from, from Putin that, hey, you shouldn't care about Ukraine. They're us anyways. Uh, and I, I've been watching Fox News uh, for the last you know, month or so. And I've been sort of saddened by this messaging from Fox News, which seems to almost echo that the propaganda of Vladimir Putin, the city destroyer. And the message is going, well, you know, who really cares about Ukraine? You know, we're not, we, should, we should get involved uh, in, in this country, which is fascinating because on that same Fox News channel, every night you hear very alarmist rhetoric about how we should care about another country, another place that is not being invaded, that is Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Taiwan is the focus of Fox News, of course, uh, not Ukraine, which is being invaded by, by uh Trump's friend, uh, Putin. Uh, so, so why should we care? Why should we not be neo-isolationist? Uh, we have lessons in history that tell us what happens when we turn our back on the world, when we try to be isolationist, uh, when we try to just dig our head in the ground like an ostrich and avoid the world. And we, as we saw in 9-11, you can't just be isolationist and build mental barriers with the world. The world will come to you. And, and let's look at history. You know, um, uh, Trump has compared himself to Winston Churchill, this, this famous prime minister uh, who stood up to a, a Putin-style aggressor, 
named Adolf Hitler. Uh, Winston Churchill famously said, you know, we, we must stop Hitler's aggression, you know, stop him from invading more countries in Europe. Uh, we need to learn from him. We also need to learn from Winston Churchill's predecessor, a prime minister named, named uh, Neville Chamberlain. Neville Chamberlain did not stand up uh, to Hitler. Uh, he acquiesced. He, uh, he allowed him to, to march out with his army and invade the country of Austria in the late 30s. And then Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia. And Neville Chamberlain appeased him and said, well, hey, it's not us. It's not our country. Why should we care? And many Europeans did the same thing. Just turn your back on Hitler, like, like turn your back on Putin today. Ignore him. Focus on our own issues here at home. Let's isolate ourselves from the fact that Putin is annihilating democracy, killing women and children, uh, attacking a country that is pro-American. Let's ignore that. And instead, of course, well, maybe focus on Taiwan. If you're watching Fox News, you know it's not being invaded. Um, but we, we can't turn our back on a murderous dictator who's sending tanks and scud missiles and firebombs into a civilized democracy. Because as we saw, when you do that, you get a Hitler who then marches across Europe and, and conquered it. Uh, Putin is not going to stop at, at uh, Ukraine. He'll go into NATO, especially the Baltic republics of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. We have to bleed him down. You, believe, this, you, believe that, you believe that that he will, if he's successful in Ukraine, that he will continue in those other Baltic nations? I do. You know, he's made it very clear all along uh, that he intends to go for them. He made it clear. He, he projected his intentions to go into Ukraine. You know, we, we've had, we had warnings, not just for months from the CIA and from the NSA. We've had years of warnings. You know, we, 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 we knew this was coming. I was, gonna ask you if you were, I was gonna ask you if you were surprised that- No, this is not happening. at all. You know, I, I don't think anybody studying the military uh, uh, movements of Russia or, or Putin's desire to rebuild the Soviet Union and to re, re, reconquer these countries that, that have moved west, and, uh, you know, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, the Baltic countries. Well, Putin's, you know, on record, Putin's on record saying that the fall of the Soviet Union was the biggest geopolitical catastrophe that ever befell the world. Exactly. He, as you said, he, he's bemoaned the collapse of what Ronald Reagan famously called the prison of nations or the evil empire. Right. Now, this is a guy who's been embraced by, by, by Trump. I don't know why, because he's a former KGB operative who wants to overthrow democracies. And he's made it very clear that after he goes for Ukraine, he's going to go for the three small Baltic republics who have joined NATO. And if he attacks them, this means he goes to war with NATO uh, because they're part of NATO. And if you join NATO, you have Article 5, which says if you attack one, you attack us all. Uh, so he, he, he has big ambitions, and we have to stop him now, make him pay a heavy price, create a quagmire in Ukraine by arming the Ukrainians with these Javelin anti-tank missiles and these Stinger anti-aircraft missiles, and make them bog down in Ukraine, just like we did in Afghanistan in the 80s, when the Soviet Union invaded that country, and we gave the rebels these equalizer missiles uh, called Stingers to shoot down Soviet aircraft. We're talking to Brian, uh, Professor Brian Williams from UMass Dartmouth. A couple of questions here that I have. Are you surprised by the response of the countries across uh, around the world uh, from this uh, attack on Ukraine by Russia? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm surprised and I'm happy. You know, in a world driven by isolationism and, and regionalism and general apathy, sometimes about the fate of humans beyond your own country's borders, you know, disconnect from other countries, especially here in America, you know, we're very disconnected uh, from the suffering of others, sometimes almost perversely proudly so, as a sign of, of pride. Um, I was thrilled by the global response. Uh, Biden launched these sanctions, uh, and the European Union, reluctantly at first, but then full force joined him. Uh, Japan, uh, Australia, uh, all, Countries around the world, two thirds of the countries. Switzerland. Switzerland. You know, when Switzerland, Switzerland joins your team for the first time in history, you know you're on the wrong side of history, yeah. as Putin is. So, so Biden ha has launched this global movement. Uh, two thirds of the world's countries have economically sanctioned um, Putin for this, this human rights violation, uh, and also NATO uh, has come together. You know, they, they were a little disunified uh, before. You know, I remember Trump wanted to pull us out of NATO uh, a few years ago. But NATO has rallied. You know, the Germans, for example, in their constitution, they can't give weapons to countries at war. 
uh, this is a thing from World War II, uh, but even they overturned their own constitution and have decided to give uh, stinger missiles and javelins uh, to the Ukrainians. Sweden has done so. Uh, a lot of weaponry is coming in. Uh, uh, Ukraine has been supported by the whole planet, basically, except for, except for China, uh, which even Chinese have walked back some of their linkage yeah. to Putin in the right. last few days, because they're seeing when you turn against the world and the world's largest economy, which is the European Union, and the second largest economy, which is America, and the fourth largest economy, Japan, and you get hurt by the dollar zone, and you get tossed out of a SWIFT code, which means you can't send money across the globe, uh, as Biden's been calling for, and we finally done it. Your economy is in a tank. Uh, and the Chinese are realizing we should not stick too closely to Putin because average Russians, they're, they're losing their income. They're, they're, the housing market, interest rates are up to 20% now from 9%. Their life savings are disappearing. Um, they can't get money from the banks. So the Russians are hurting uh, and the world is unified like never before. And I'm thrilled uh, that people are following the Biden administration and, and NATO and joining in this, this military and uh, economic alliance. Were you surprised that because you've lived there, so you know the people, it's inspiring to see the response by the Ukrainian people to fight for their country. And it's, it, it is inspiring. I, I don't know how you cannot be that they are just not going to give up. Oh, it's fascinating. You know, for months now, I followed Putin's propaganda, his uh, disinformation uh, about, oh, the Ukrainians are all Nazis. You, you know, the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, is actually a Jew. It's ridiculous. Right. Uh, with, family, with family, with family that survived the Holocaust, right? And his grandfather fought uh, against the Nazis. So you know, you, propaganda. People in Russia are, are eating his propaganda up, of course. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the, he, he thought Putin thought he would just send in. He called these guys peacekeepers. He'd send in a, a quick shock and awe style invasion and uh, do regime change. You know, to remind us of George Bush Jr. and his quagmire in Iraq in 2003. And you saw how that went for us. You know, we ended up fighting for for. A, from 2003 to 2011 in this quagmire that, that Bush created, we lost almost 4,500 troops, uh, spent almost $2 trillion. The Iraqis fought back. Uh, Occupation has become dangerous. And Putin's grand plan is no shock and awe, like our invasion of Iraq was. It's more like shock and awful. Um, his troops are bogged down. Uh, the Ukrainians are rallying. You know, I was watching on the Ukrainian news today, uh, women, mothers, in the thousands, women, the household women, you know, house mothers uh, are getting weapons, they're joining the, the territorial defense units. Tens of thousands of average Ukrainians with no military training are fighting back. You know, they're, they're, they're fighting in militias alongside the army. Uh, and of course, Vladimir Zelensky, uh, the president of Ukraine, has become the hero of the day. You know, uh, he, he was asked by the Americans, do you want us to evacuate you? And he said, no, don't evacuate me like the, the Afghan president who's a coward. Ashraf Ghani, remember this summer, him flying out in a helicopter, it was, it was cowardly. Um, he, I'm staying here. Uh, I, he, said, he said, I don't want to ride, I need ammunition. Right. Uh, he's really rallied his people. He, he served as, as a, a catalyst, an inspiration. Uh, and across the country, these outgunned Ukrainian troops are, are ambushing much larger Russian columns. Uh, they, they prevented the Russian special forces from uh, seizing the main airport in Kiev. Uh, by sh they shot down airplanes, including huge transport planes. Uh, so they're almost like a nation at arms, uh, and they're really fighting to defend something that Putin didn't think they would fight to defend, which is freedom and democracy, Ukrainian identity, and, and, the, and the president they elected, Zelensky. We've got a couple minutes left, and I know you're busy, and I appreciate your time. A couple questions, two questions that I have left. One, um, you lived in Russia, too. Do you, would you be surprised? Because there is a lot of protests going on in Russia right now. The Russian people aren't in favor of this. Do you believe that there could be more of a groundswell in Russia? Because it seems as though, as a matter of fact, that some of the Russian troops don't even know why they're there, really. Um, could that be an issue that the Russian people, they don't want war, they don't want a nuclear war. Um, we want this over. Could that happen? It could. It's hard to gauge, because you're dealing with a country that isn't really opaque. They're not letting us know what the people think. Uh, the Russian government has, has clamped down on the media. You can't, you can't call it a war, by the way. It has to be called a special military operation. And anybody who's not spouting uh, Putin's nonsensical propaganda, nonsensical propaganda about him fighting Nazis uh, from doing genocide in Ukraine is silenced. Now, there were these protests you probably saw in the last few days 
in, in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. Yeah. People bravely on the streets. Uh, lots, of them, and, lots of people. Yeah, lots of them. And I think 6,000 by now have been arrested. And now they've, they've done these draconian laws. If you protest against the war, you can get up to 15 years in jail. Uh, so Putin is no friend of democracy. Uh, he's crushed these big democratic protests before. Remember, they had a huge uh, waves of protests six years ago, eight years ago against him. He is a dictator. He will eventually do to them what the Chinese did in Tiananmen Square. If they try coming out en masse, he will crush them. So, you know, I don't put a lot of faith and a lot of hope in the, a groundswell uh, of Russian people somehow coming out and changing this dictator and, and his motives. You know, although I am heartened by the fact that we keep seeing these, these reports from Ukraine, as you mentioned, uh, of Russian troops in that country, many of them 19 years old, 20 year old conscripts forced into this war based on lies, you know, like, like we're in Iraq, these WMDs we're, we're told about, and they get there and they don't wanna fight and die to conquer someone else's country. Uh, a fellow people who are friends to, to the Russians. Uh, and we see these, these conscripts over and over again, uh, turning over the weapons, Ukrainians, surrendering, uh, sending messages home to the mother saying, I don't want to die here. A uh, famous message was read the other day by a soldier who died at 19 years old. So Ma, I'm afraid I'm going to die here. So maybe the, the lack of, of willpower amongst these conscripts who are forced into this war to die for Putin's dream of crushing a democracy, you know, that they may defect, uh, they may not fight effectively, uh, they won't risk their lives, and they're not fighting with a tenth of the heart and spirit and fighting metal that the Ukrainian women and the presidents and the average citizens are because they're fighting and dying to make sure that next generation, the grandchildren, live in a free democratic Ukraine. And that's worth fighting and dying for. Not being a member of a, of a Hitler-esque Putin army marching into a free country and crushing women and children and civilians in the name of fighting Putin's war of reconstituting a Soviet empire. Last question for you, and it's hard, I know, trying to put your prognosticator hat on, but what do you have a, an idea of what may happen down the road is in the next month, two months or so? You know, I fear this will happen. You know, I, I think we're buoyed and positive about this Ukrainian stunning success. Uh, they're fighting back and they've slowed down this giant column of, of 40 uh, tanks and artillery and support units uh, moving on, on Kiev. But, you know, I think Russian firepower and the fact that the Russians are willing to indiscriminately kill civilians will come into play. I fear that Putin doesn't care about the Geneva Conventions, about the rights to protect women and children in a war zone. I think they will eventually get to Kiev uh, and they will eventually surround it and penetrate it. And it will lead to a massive urban battle, uh, perhaps the greatest battle in Europe since World War II. And this will create a mass wave of refugees, the biggest re wave of refugees we've seen uh, since World War II. I'm basing my, my dark prognosis upon Putin's past behavior. You know, when, when he confronts resistance, as he did in the breakaway Republic of Chechnya, he annihilates it. He, he doesn't care about the beautiful city we, we discussed of Kiev. He will flatten it. He will rubbleize it. Uh, and I think he will probably try putting in a puppet government. Uh, and overthrowing this democratically elected government of this heroic figure, uh, Vladimir Zelensky. I fear for Zelensky's life. Yeah. There's, a, there's a chance they'll kill him. You know, he, he killed, Putin killed the president uh, of breakaway Chechnya. Uh, and certainly he has a price on his head. So, you know, I'm not optimistic that in the long run, uh, they can hold a lot of territory uh, against the Russians. But I am optimistic that once they do put their puppet government in Kiev, and do occupy this city and smash it, that the people will wage an insurgency, just like the one we, we, we saw in Iraq when we overthrew Saddam Hussein in just three weeks. Because the hardest part of a war like this is not the initial invasion, it's occupation, phase four, they call it. And he has too small an army to occupy this Texas-sized country. They will wage a bloody war of insurgency, the Ukrainians will, against this hostile occupation and bleed down the Russians and make them pay a heavy price for occupying their lands, just like we paid a heavy price for trying to occupy Iraq under Bush from 2003 uh, to 2011. And you think the NATO alliance and the, and the global community will still be together uh, in their opposition to what's going on? Yes, I think NATO is remarkable, the unity of purpose NATO now has. 
you know, it, it, many people didn't believe that Russia really would attack. And that's the whole founding purpose for NATO, is to save free Europe uh, from another Russian attack. But now that rise on debt, the, the reason for, for creation of NATO uh, has been reinforced. Uh, I think you'll continue to have a vast supply of these uh, anti-tank Javelin missiles, uh, which can be used against troops or any, anything. You know, those will be a game changer, just like the Stinger missiles were uh, against the Soviet Air Force uh, in Afghanistan in the 80s. Uh, and I think NATO will continue to make this a bloody quagmire. Uh, they'll wage a proxy war, a surrogate war against the Russians to make this invasion as much of a costly lesson for Putin as possible and make a, a, a draw a line at Ukraine and say, listen, if you try coming for Bulgaria or Romania, look at the price you're paying for trying to occupy a free people who are fighting back against you and bogging you down and sending thousands of Russian GIE bonds home to grieving parents in caskets. Uh, NATO will try to make it a bloodbath, a meat grinder uh, for Putin. And I think that support will continue because there's, there's never been more unity in NATO than I see right now. Professor Brian Williams from UMass Dartmouth, thank you so much for joining us. Very, um, very informational. I think that people will, will, will appreciate that as well. So I, I do thank you for taking the time. And um, we could have questions for you down the road, but, uh, but, but this is very helpful. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on. And uh, I'm always here if you need me. Take care. That's going to do it for this edition of A Conversation With. I'm Jim Marshall. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you again soon.